Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Hidden Manna for the End Time with your host, David Eels. Hello, friends. This is David Eels. God bless you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, We have some very important revelations to share with you that were shared with me over the last uh, 30-something years, Uh, sometimes in word of knowledge or word of wisdom. They are very, I'll say, untraditional, but you should expect that in these days. Um, The traditions of men have been making of no effect the Word of God. And uh, these revelations will help you to cooperate with God in the time to come in manifesting His Son in you and in understanding the things that are going on around you and the great purpose that God has for these end times. May God give you eyes to see and ears to hear so that these will be a great blessing unto you. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You may hear some things here that um, are not fitting with your traditions. God bless you. Part 3. The Church and Tribulation Now, let me show you the parallel view, because you can see a lot in this one. The parallel view is if you took all three of those pictures and you made transparencies out of them, and you laid them right over the top of one another, and you looked through them to see a whole story. Let me me show you this. For instance, the first view, the time in Egypt. The judgments that fell upon Egypt were very, very similar to the judgments that fall in the book of Revelation. Notice that? And the judgments at first came upon the Egyptians and the, um, the Israelis too. And there came a time when God separated between the Egyptians and the Israel. I, I propose to you that the, the point is that God's people are very much like the Egyptians right now, and uh, it will take a few judgments before they decide to separate from Egypt and live in Goshen. Okay, And when they do, uh, God's going to separate the judgments between them and the Egyptians, and the Egypt, if they're going to fall on the Egyptians. Okay, um, Egypt is a type of the world. Um, At the end of their time of bondage in Egypt, they left Egypt. See, we're talking parallel now. That's the end of the story. See, we're coming to the end of our time in Egypt, and we're going to leave Egypt. And and at that time, there were seven days between the Passover and when they left Egypt. I want to talk to you about the last seven days in Egypt. Okay, that's on the parallel view. Uh, To point out another parallel view, the second one, is that, of course, the church is going through the wilderness as the last seven days, but the wilderness happens at the same time the judgments on Egypt happen. You see what I'm talking about? Sliding one right over the other. And you're looking through them and you're seeing God's people being tried while the world is being judged, you see. And then you take the last one and you slide it over it, and this is the time in the promised land. Now, you understand there, there's more than one parable to every one of these. So I don't think people ought to argue about them because if you see something that's there, it's there, you know. Some people say, well, the promised land couldn't be heaven because they have enemies to conquer. Well, we have enemies in the heavenlies who are being conquered. You see, they're going to be cast down, you see. Not only that, this world is a promised land because if you remember at the last trump, the very next verse says... The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ. And there are enemies in this promised land. You know that this land has been promised to us. The meek shall inherit the earth. This is our promised land. We pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth. Thy kingdom come on earth. See, This is going to be part of God's kingdom. And right now, there are enemies in it that have to be conquered. See, so you've got the third... third view there that you're looking through, the, the third transparency, okay? Pick, I want to pick one of them, the first one, and point out to you the last seven days in Egypt. The last seven days in Egypt. Go to, um, oh, I already told you, Deuteronomy 16. 
First of all, he said in verse 16, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord. Appear before the Lord means appear before the Lord. <laughs> but if you take that as a type and a shadow, we can see that there's going to come a time, three times, symbolically, that God's people come before the Lord. And all three of these represent the same thing. Okay? I'm going to pick out two of these and I'm going to pick out another one. I'm going to pick out the, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Marriage Feast. I want to talk to you about the last seven days in Egypt, okay? You follow me? The last seven days, because all these have to do with that. Three times in the year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. Well, that's, of course, his house, right? In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, I'm not going to discuss that one because it's talking about the first fruits. The Feast of Weeks was the first fruits. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before me empty, before the Lord empty, which means, of course, it, it was said in, uh, for instance, uh, chapter 12, I think, that uh, you had to bring the fruits of your labor before the Lord. Nobody's going to come before the Lord without bearing fruit, is what he's saying. Okay? Nobody's going to be manifest before his kingdom or in his kingdom. Okay, uh, look at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. He talks about this Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was after the Passover, after they had eaten the lamb, and they were getting ready to leave Egypt. By the way, we're always supposed to be leaving Egypt, but as a corporate body, the church is going to leave Egypt through the wilderness. That's what's going to happen. The overwhelming majority of God's people are living in the world and of the world and saved by the world. You know, And uh, God's going to change all that. Uh in verse 15, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. This is the last seven days that they were in Egypt, or the world. The last seven days. It is a type of the tribulation. And you know when Jesus came, there's a perfect parallel between Jesus' coming and the man-child's coming in the book of Revelation. When Jesus came, he shared the unleavened bread, didn't he? And he rebuked the disciples. In fact, well, he warned the disciples. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Do you think we've got any Pharisees and Sadducees today? Lots of them. Lots of them. And um, beware of their leaven. And they understood in the same, in Matthew chapter 16, that he meant their teaching. Any teaching that, that is, has got man's word in it is... Um, is not unleavened yet, is it? Okay. Uh, what is leaven? Leaven is what you put in the bread to make it more appetizing for the flesh, right? Do you know doctrines that make the doctrine of Scripture more appetizing to the flesh? You know, like pre-trib all flyaway raptures or uh, unconditional eternal security or uh, ultimate reconciliation or uh, God is a God of love and He would never do that. You, you know these doctrines, you know. That's leaven, right? It's just, it's put in there to make it more appetizing for the flesh, for the old carnal man to accept it, right? It fills churches up with tares. <laughs> uh, so, but he goes on to say, you shall put away leaven out of your houses for whosoever eateth leaven bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Ooh, that's, that's a, Terrible judgment, isn't it? During those seven days, the people that feed on the unleavened bread have got nothing to worry about. But the people who add leaven to the bread are going to be cut off. That's what he's saying. And, you know, Jesus was that way. Jesus, God was accepting the bulls and goats that the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people that were underneath them um, were sacrificing. He was accepting their sacrifice. But when Jesus came, he said, if I had not come and spoken unto you, you wouldn't have sin. But now you've got no excuse for your sin. See, when he came and shared the unleavened bread, it made him responsible. Not only did he share the unleavened bread, but it was confirmed with signs and wonders. And that made him more responsible. He said if these signs and wonders had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. See? So what we've got coming is the same thing. It's an outpouring of signs and wonders because of the, the latter rain and uh, a sudden deluge of the unleavened bread. It's all going to hit us at the same time. So he's saying that, that these people, 
that partake of this leaven during the seven days are going to be cut off. Okay, that's the last seven days. Okay, um, verse thirty-seven. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, which means tabernacles. Okay, about six hundred thousand. There's that six hundred, six hundred thousand footmen that were men besides children. So when they were leaving Egypt, they went. The first place they went was to Sukkoth. By the way, it was seven days from the time they began to leave Egypt until they crossed through the sea and were out. Well, that's exactly what the book of Revelation is telling us, folks. You know, that the last seven days, God's people are going to be leaving Egypt, you know, and on the last day, they will be out. Okay? Um, verse, this verse, uh, Sukkoth, means tabernacles. Tabernacles was for seven days. And in tabernacles, which was also called the Feast of Ingathering, right? In tabernacles, they built a, a booth or a tabernacle, a temporary booth or tabernacle that they dwelt in for seven days. And at the end of that seven days, they tore this booth or tabernacle down and then they went to their permanent dwelling place, you know, which is a symbol of what? Walking in this body for seven days, this temporary tabernacle. For seven days, it being torn down and us receiving our permanent tabernacle. You see that, right? Okay. Um, look at uh, Leviticus chapter 23. I'll come back there, but look at Leviticus 23. First of all, that seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles was a rehearsal. I don't know what your Bible says. Some Bibles say convocation. Some say rehearsal. But um, in verse um, 33, it says, For the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation, or rehearsal. What, are they, what were they rehearsing for? Because it's going to be fulfilled in our day. It's going to be... The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You know, the, the spirit of this is that this is going to be fulfilled through the saints in the last seven days in Egypt or the world. And you shall do no servo work. See, during the last seven days, um, we're going to have to cease from our own works and enter into Christ's works. You know that we have entered into the, to the millennial Sabbath? Do you wonder, does it wonder... Do you wonder that why God's judgment has suddenly been turned up? You know why? Because we've now entered into the Sabbath and men still haven't ceased from their works. And there was a judgment upon man's works when he worked on the Sabbath. See, And these days, the only works that are legal is Christ's works, not ours. Verse 36, Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And on the eighth day, there it is right there. The eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you or a rehearsal. You know what the eighth day was, right? The day of the Lord. What happened on the eighth day? Circumcision. The flesh was cut off. You, you understand what's going to happen when Noah's in the ark and the, and the ark goes up? The flesh is cut off. Noah will sow no more flesh. You get my meaning? Circumcision was so that man would not sow flesh anymore. Okay, this is it right here, the eighth day. This is where this begins. Okay, Shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. What did Noah have in the ark? A solemn assembly. You know, the saints are coming to a solemn assembly on the beginning of the eighth day. A solemn assembly unto the Lord, right? Verse 42, you shall dwell in tabernacles or booths, same word, seven days. All that are home born in Israel shall dwell in booths. Of course, that's us. We're home born, born in Israel, born into the, grafted into the olive tree. <clears throat> that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths 
when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. Now, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. There's few examples, actually, of, um, of the Feast of Tabernacles being fulfilled. One of them is in Nehemiah chapter 8. And verse 15 is a good example of what these, what these booths or tabernacles were made of. They were made, it says, of olive branches and the branches of the wild olive. Well, that's Romans eleven twenty four all over, isn't it? See, the, the wild olive was, of course, the Gentiles who were grafted in, and the tame olives were the, the uh, physical Israelites, not spiritual, but physical Israelites, who, who were in their olive tree. And when he got to the bottom of that story, he said, by the way, and so all Israel shall be saved. You know who all Israel is? People think it's talking about all the people over there in physical Israel. It's not. Only a remnant of those is going to be saved, the Bible says, very plainly. He's talking about, when he says all Israel, look at the text. He's talking about everybody who's grafted into the olive tree. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles who are faithful. That's all Israel. And that's who's going to be saved. All of the elect at the time of the restoration of all things. Okay, All of the elect are going to be restored. So these um, booths were made with the branches of the the olives and the wild olive. And they, they made them and lived in them for seven days. It was the last seven days. Now, if it was the last seven days, that would be the time of the unleavened bread, wouldn't it? The same time as the unleavened bread. Look down in verse 18. Also, day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. Isn't that interesting? Now you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread being involved here. You know what? I believe God's people are going to read the Word of God like they've never read it before in the tribulation period because suddenly they're going to be highly motivated. They know that they don't have much time left and they know that these worldly things do not count and they're not going to amount to anything eternal. And so they're going to be highly motivated. And you see here that they were keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Word of God. You know, there's nothing you can study or read that's more important than the Word of God. It's eternal. Men can have lots of opinions and most any book you pick up, that's what you're going to find is a lot of opinions. But there's nothing more important than this right here. See? This is eternal. And God will bring it to your remembrance to protect you. And it has eternal value because when the, when the sower went forth to sow, which was Jesus, he sowed the seed, which was sperma, the Greek word is. And the sperma of Jesus is the word of God. And he sows it in our heart to bring forth fruit. Where does fruit come from? It comes from the Word of God being birthed in us. It comes from the Word of God being manifested in us. That's why we have to eat the lamb, all of the lamb, all of the lamb, all of the Word, right? It's highly important that we study the Word. And if you don't, if you don't have this, let me tell you from my own experience, if, you don't, if you're not doing this, ask God to put it in you. He, go, he can give it to you as a gift. I mean, I, I, over the years, I've felt the great value in this gift he's given me, but I felt times when it was leaving, and I would cry out to the Lord to bring it back, to put it back in my heart so that I would do it again. It's a gift from God. We don't, we don't do anything of ourselves. You know, our sufficiency is from him, the Bible says. You know, Anything we need, we should ask the Lord to put it in our heart. He'll do it, and he'll put the unleavened bread in our heart. You ask for the truth. I ask for the truth. I prayed diligently for the truth before he hit me with that word of knowledge and wisdom. And it's been going on up until this day. So they ate the word, uh, word of the Lord for seven days in those booths for seven days, and then they tore them down and went to their permanent home on the eighth day. There it is again, on the eighth day. Interesting. Everything seems to be lining up here. Yeah. And the eighth day was a solemn assembly. Verse 18. One more I want to share with you. It's also the last seven days, and it's the marriage feast. You know, there's a lot of confusion about the marriage feast. And I've discovered the confusion is because people try to interpret it according to their doctrine. If you just go to the people that know about the marriage feast 
and let them explain it to you. The people that don't have their own axe to grind or their own doctrine to prove, you know, just people that understand what, what the Jewish marriage feast was about, you get a pretty clear picture. But when people have their own doctrine that they have to prove, they have to confuse the marriage feast. Have you ever heard that the, that the virgins were the bride? That's one of the most commonly held views. That's totally false. The virgins are not the bride. They were not the bride in the marriage feast. You know, they were attendants to the bride. They were escorts of the bride, but they were not the bride. You say, well, David, I thought we all were the bride. Well, you know what? We're all perfect too, aren't we? The Bible says, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You know, God perfected us, but not everybody's going to come into perfection, are they? Perfection means maturity, okay? Maturity in Christ, right? Everybody's not going to come into perfection, but that's what's been given to us. We've been given everything through Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean we're going to attain to it. What we attain is what we go after by faith, you see? Now, we all have the position of bride, but not everybody's going to be the bride. Some are going to be the virgins. Some are going to be the, um, the friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist called himself. He said he wasn't the bride. He was the friend of the bridegroom. That's part of the marriage ceremony, right? The children of the, the uh, marriage um, sanctuary. Okay? There are different members to this, this uh, marriage procession. Okay? And um, the, marriage procession, but the, the marriage feast was for seven days. Jacob married two wives. Both of them had a seven-day marriage feast in Genesis 29. And he served seven years for them. That's a parallel. Seven years are seven days. They are the last seven days, you see. Um, also, Samson in Judges 14. Samson, um, of course, he didn't come to collect his bride because she had been unfaithful in some things, but there was a seven-day marriage feast. Let me explain to you how this works. The marriage feast is on the earth. The marriage supper is in heaven, but the marriage feast is on the earth. I don't know if you've heard this before, but, but Jesus in Matthew 22, from 1 through 6, invited the Jews to come and partake of the marriage feast. And of course, they were all too busy. Okay. They were looking to their merchandise and, and they were mistreating God's servants. And so he says he sent his servants and destroyed their city. In 70 A.D., that's what happened. Okay? But they were invited to the marriage feast. John the Baptist said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. See, in Jesus' day, there was a fulfillment of this in type. It's the type because in our day, the, the whole fulfillment of it will come to pass. So Jesus was inviting the Jews, first of all, to come and partake of the marriage feast. I'm going to tell you something that the Lord told me. The marriage feast is bread, wine, and meat. Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. Bread, wine, and meat. You know what the meat is? The meat of the Word of God in, in Hebrews chapter 5, you know. There's the milk and there's the meat, right? And um, there's the, the bread and the wine, the Lord's Supper. Which, you, Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. What Jesus was feeding in this feast was his body and his blood. His body was the word of God that came down out of heaven that gives life to the world, the bread, right? And his life, the life of the flesh is in the blood. You know, you can understand, I think it was Stan was talking about, you can quote the word of God and know it by heart, but that don't mean you know what it's talking about, right? There's a nature that lives in the word of God. There's a life that belongs in the word of God, you see? So, so Jesus was basically feeding himself. They were eating the lamb, you see. The people that came and listened were eating the lamb. Okay. So he offered it in Matthew 22 from 1 through 6 to the Jews. They refused it, and then he turned to the Gentiles, and he offered it to them. The marriage feast is here, you see. Now, the Bible's very plain, and the custom is very plain that you have a marriage feast of seven days in which the bridegroom is basically the king and the bride is the queen for seven days. After that time, they go by and they pick up the virgins with their lamps. 
because it's always at night. They usually had ten because the virgins only had one part in the marriage feast. Their part was to escort the bride and the groom to the groom's home. And in the groom's home, they of course had the, the marriage supper and the kathuba, which was the marriage document that the, the virgins had to witness. They had to witness the marriage document. Okay. Um, in, in the Peshitta, which is the Eastern text, which is the a Palestinian text, um, they actually, it actually says in Matthew 25 that the, not only the groom, but the groom and the bride came for the ten virgins. Are you saying that's the way it's supposed to be, David? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that they understood it was according to their ceremony that it was the bride and the groom that were escorted to the groom's home. And the Bible says that. It says, for instance, in Luke chapter 12, He said, let your loins be girt about, and your, verse 35, and your lamps burning. Who had the lamps? The virgins, right? And be yourselves like unto men looking for their Lord when he shall return from the marriage feast. The Lord is leaving the marriage feast. He's picking up the virgins at midnight. When did they leave Egypt? Midnight. And going to where? The groom's home. You understand what I'm saying? Does everybody understand that there's not... Let me ask you, is anybody here that believes that there are that the tribulation is three and a half years? Anybody see that? Hmm? You thought about that? Okay. Let me point something out to you. There was three and a half years under the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. He mentions it. And the dragon had seven heads and ten horns. But the crowns were upon the heads and not the horns. Then you go to Revelation chapter 13 where there is a seven head, ten horned beast and now the, cr the crowns are upon the horns for three and a half more years in Revelation chapter 13. That's two different beasts, each of them for three and a half years. Revelation 17 tells us that there are, there, there, are, um, there are eight of these beasts. And we've already been through six of them, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. There's two left. There's the dragon, which is going to be for a short time, the Bible says, and then the Revelation 13 beast, you see. So you, some people make these two beasts the same beast, but the Bible tells you that they're consecutive, and it tells you that during that time, they both rule for three and a half years. So actually, there is a seven-year period of time, see? And um, that doctrine was mostly put forth by the... Um, um, oh, gosh, I'm forgetting the name of them now. Um, the people that believe everything, all this was fulfilled back in the days of Jesus. Um, and it actually was. You know, because most, almost every revelation is fulfilled more than once. It's fulfilled one physical time usually, and sometimes several spiritual times. What happened in the days of Jesus is, again, happening in our day. You know, the Lord spoke to me some years ago about this, and He said to me, everything that happened in the days of the Gospels and in the book of Acts, was going to be fulfilled again. Now, you understand the Gospels and the book of Acts are a prophecy of the end time. There are so many things hidden in there. There's much more information hidden in there than there is in a lot of other places. And when I, when I realized this and the Lord started pointing these things out to me, it was just an explosion of understanding in my mind. One of the next messages I'm going to t share with you is going to be revelations that the Lord showed me about that. But what happened in um, the days preceding, well, between the time of Jesus and 70 A.D., um, those judgments that led up to the destruction of the harlot in 70 A.D. by the beast are the same ones that are going to be happening here. The exact same thing is going to be happening here. And as you know, in that day, the people of God were not involved in the judgment. They 
accepted the prophecy or the warning from Jesus in Matthew 24 to flee to the mountains when they saw Jerusalem encompassed with armies. They fled to the mountains. The mountains obviously represent the, the high places of God or escape or the ark or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and the, the harlot was then judged by the beast and destroyed by the beast. And um, that's exactly what we've got coming. Do you understand why God raises up beasts? You know, everyone, isn't it amazing that the six beasts that the earth is already seeing, that the Bible mentions, Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, Media Persia and Greece and Rome, these six world beasts were raised up by God to conquer a rebellious people. And isn't it amazing that when you see the false prophets speaking, like in Jeremiah and Isaiah and other places, the false prophets are predicting that they're not going to be conquered by the beast. They're going to escape the beast. Well, it never happened, did it? And, and yet, now they're saying the same thing. We're going to escape. The beast is not going to have any power over us. We're not going to be involved in that time. They use 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to prove that. But it says very plainly there that not to be deceived that our gathering together unto the Lord is not going to happen except the falling away come first and the son of perdition is revealed. It's not going to happen. And the, the beast is going to once again bring God's people to their cross. It's God's purpose. It was the beast that put Jesus on his cross, right? And it was the predestined will of God for that to happen. I'll just read it to you. Acts chapter 2 and... Verse 23 is this, Him being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you by the hands of lawless men did crucify and slay, whom God raised up, having loosed the pangs of death. Again, in chapter 4, it says, For of a truth in this city against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel foreordained to come to pass. Now, for some reason, people have the idea that because Jesus went to his cross, we don't have to go to ours. But we do. I mean, God used the beast and the harlot and the son of perdition to bring Jesus to his cross. And he's going to do the same with the church. What happened in Jesus' day is going to be fulfilled again. The same cast of characters is still with us. They just, I mean, they just, they've multiplied, but they're still with us. And that's what the Lord told me. He said, everything that happened in the Gospels and in the book of Acts was going to happen again in our day, except the cast of characters has been multiplied many times over. So you can see a prophecy there of what's going to happen. And... Um, Jesus couldn't put himself on the cross. God predestined and foreordained that, God, that he would use the son of perdition, Judas, the harlot, apostate Judaism, and the beast, the Roman Empire, to do that. Now we've got those same characters, except now it's not apostate Judaism, it's apostate Christianity. See, And how many of you know that our biggest enemy in the days to come is not even going to be the beast. It's going to be the harlot. Because the, really, the beast didn't want anything to do with Jesus, did it? They didn't want it that. They were being um, politically pressured into doing this with Jesus because of jealousy and because of the false prophets that ruled over Israel. They were being pressured into this. We need what's coming, but we can't imagine how great this is going to be. The, the outpouring of the unleavened bread for seven days is going to be started by the man-child in Revelation chapter 12. This outpouring of the unleavened bread. The truth that's going to be given in the last seven days is going to be uh, unimaginable. Uh, truths that have been hidden from the foundation of the world are suddenly going to be revealed to God's people. And the truth is going to make everybody responsible. Because you're not really all that responsible until you hear the truth. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Sin is imputed when you know truth and you reject it, you see. So truth is going to divide the church. What we're calling the church, what we observe to be the church, is going to divide the church. Truth is. And um, 
Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 32 for just a, a few minutes with me. Isaiah 32. This is talking about the wilderness. It says so in the text. The wilderness, as you know, Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation 17 tells us that the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years are both called the wilderness. And the church is going into that wilderness. Verse 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in justice. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind. Isn't that something? You've got a secret place. And a covert from the tempest, as streams of water in a dry place, as the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Well, where are the people of God? Verse 9. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. Hear my voice, you careless daughters. Give ear unto my speech, for days beyond a year shall you be troubled. You know what days beyond a year that is? See, the careless women have been thinking that they were going to fly away before the first year. But they're actually going to go all the way through the seven and 40 days into the eighth before they're going to be rescued. For days beyond a year shall you be troubled, you careless women. For the vintage shall fail. And the ingathering, Exodus 23 calls the ingathering, that's the harvest. And the ingathering shall not come. Why? Because the vintage shall fail. There's no fruit. Remember what you need for fruit. You need the unleavened bread of the Word of God. That's going to be shared during the tribulation period. And not only that, what else is going to be shared during the tribulation period is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You remember... After Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit called the former rain. It empowered those disciples to walk like Jesus walked. You know, even Peter, who denied the Lord after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he stood up and was used to convert thousands, 3,000, 5,000. Um, well, it was after three-and-a-half years of the man-child's ministry that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit came. You know when the latter rain, everybody tells us the latter rain started in the 1900s. That's not true. The Bible tells us in Hosea that it's going to come on the morning of the third day. Here we are. We're on the morning of the third day. Now there's something else we're told. Because what the Lord told me was that everything that happened in the Gospels and in the book of Acts was going to be fulfilled again. You know what that means? It means after, the man, after three and a half years of the man-child's ministry, there's going to be an outpouring of the latter rain. And the disciples are going to, because they're about to face the beast and the harlot, they're going to be empowered to walk as Jesus walked, to take up their cross and so on. You think the latter rain, you think the former rain started at the end of Jesus' ministry? It didn't start there because... At the end of Jesus' ministry, he breathed on the disciples. He said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And then, ten days later, it came as a rushing mighty wind. See, Jesus had the form of rain before he gave it to the disciples. The first fruits in the tribulation period, they're going to have the latter rain. And they're going to impart the latter rain to the disciples, the witnesses at the beginning of the second three and a half years. Everything that has happened will happen. History is going to repeat itself. Ecclesiastes 1.9 The things that have been are the things that shall be. The things that have been done are the things that shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. History keeps on repeating itself. The Bible says we have a, a word of prophecy made more sure. You know, you hear a lot of prophecies. And you're, you just don't know sometimes which ones are right and which ones are wrong. But we have a prophecy that's sure. You know what it is? It's history. The things that have been are the things that shall be. What's happened will happen. What happened with Israel? Everybody thinks that somehow the church is better than Israel. They, they, won't, they won't fall into the same mistakes that Israel made. Now, that's, that's a lie. You know, they've both fallen away for the last 2,000 years. Um, 
What happened to Israel has happened to the church. There is a falling away. And what did the former reign come to restore? Joel chapter 2. Everything that the palmer worm and the canker worm took from God's people, the former reign came to restore. But they rejected it. The Jews did. And now, what do you think the latter rain is going to restore? Everything that the palm worm, the canker worm, the caterpillar has taken from God's crop. We're God's crop. The latter rain is going to restore. You know what happened in the book of Acts? The only difference between what happened there and what's going to happen here is it's going to happen on a much larger scale. Much larger scale. A great outpouring of the Holy Spirit to empower people. People are afraid of the tribulation period. We shouldn't be afraid of that. That's where everything that Christ is is going to be restored to the body. All of the unleavened bread is going to be restored to the body. All of the power of the Spirit is going to be restored to the body. This is our opportunity to see um, the book of Acts and the ministry of Jesus. Because a lot of folks don't realize we're going to see the ministry of Jesus. It's just not going to be in that same physical body that he was in. You know why Jesus left that body? He left that body so he could live in a corporate body, so he could continue doing what he did in that body. And what happened? Religion. That's what happened. Religion. A falling away. God laid out the plan. It was perfect. We are the body of Christ. We're not the body of another Christ. We're not the body of a weak and worthless Christ. A Christ that doesn't save, heal, deliver. We're the body of the Jesus Christ. And as soon as we figure this out, he's going to be able to... <coughs> excuse me. He's going to be able to live in us. That is his plan. And the restoration that we're going to see in the tribulation period is Christ living in his body. And it is awesome. God has uh, shared with me several revelations about this, and I'd like to share one of them with you tomorrow about the coming of Christ in his body. And it's exciting to me to, to see the real gospel. The real gospel is that we don't live anymore. Christ lives in us. The gospel can't be fulfilled unless we walk by faith. We, begin, we need to begin to see ourselves as the body of Jesus Christ. In this wilderness that we're reading about here, these women thought they were going to escape. The women, of course, are the seed of the seven women in the book of Revelation, which is the church. Right? Seven women shall take hold of one man, Isaiah 4 and 1, in that day, saying, we'll eat our own bread and we'll wear our own apparel, but let us be called by your name. Take thou away our reproach. Isn't that where the church is now? Look, Jesus, never mind that unleavened bread, we'll eat our own bread, we'll, we'll make our own, we'll put leaven in it. You know? And never mind being dressed up with the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 13. You know? We'll put on our own works. You know? That's where the church is now. But God loves his people. And he's got a plan. And it's going to be perfected. I don't say that all of the called are going to be saved. They're not. But all of the elect will. Many are the call, but few are the chosen. He spoke that at the end of the parable where he invited them to come and partake of the marriage feast. And the ones that were called, many of the ones that were called, didn't come. They were too busy. Too busy with the affairs of this life. And they didn't come. And yet, that feast was the one that was to empower them to walk like Jesus walked. Instead, many of those people went into their great and terrible day of the Lord and were destroyed by the beast because they didn't accept it. And that's history. That's history, and that's what's going to happen. You see, In the days that are coming, the people who will, will, will eat the unleavened bread of the Word of God will naturally bring forth the fruit of Jesus Christ. 
Let, let, me, let me exhort you to get into the Bible and just read it for yourself. Don't accept what anybody says. You know, I told you I had some words of knowledge. Are you supposed to believe that? Well, you can study the Word of God, and, and if you get a witness, fine. But anybody that says they're prophesying to you or gives you a word of knowledge, you're not necess- that, that doesn't necessarily supposed to be a, a, an effect upon you because it may not be true. You know? So what I did in the very beginning of my Christian walk was I got very suspicious. First of all, I wasn't, I wasn't raised as a Christian and I wasn't raised with the Word of God. But I suddenly got this consuming urge to read the Word of God and I read it. And when I felt an urge to go visit the people of God because I really hadn't been going to any church, I was just reading day and night, day and night, day and night. I was invited to a church and I went there and I could see that they were denying most of what I had read. And I thanked God after that that I didn't go and accept from man the truth before I had to go and look it up for myself. I saw this as a great benefit to me that I had had not been schooled in the Bible, honestly. I found this to be a great benefit because I was just looking for truth and I didn't have my own ax to grind and I didn't have to prove any religion. And when the religious folks came to me and told me, look, David, God doesn't do that anymore, I knew they were liars because I was seeing him do it. And so I left that church looking for one that believed in more of the gospel. And I found one, stayed there for about a year. <laughs> you know what? You, if you study this word, you'll outgrow religion very, very fast. We don't need religion. Religion is, a, is the harlot. And it's not just that harlot over there. <laughs> it's usually the one you're sitting in, you know. Uh, we don't need religion telling us what the Bible says. We need to go and find out for ourselves. The Bible says, seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, fear and trembling. Well, that's what's going to happen to this, these uh, seven women here. in the. They learn to tremble. Verse 11, tremble, you women that are at ease. Be troubled, you careless ones. Strip you. In other words, take off your own clothing that you put on. Put on Christ and make you bare and gird sackcloth upon your loins. They shall smite upon the breast for the pleasant fields and for the fruitful vine. In other words, they're going to desire after fruit. Well, I thought we had fruit. No, we had religion. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars. Yea, upon all the houses of of joy in the joyous city. For the palace shall be forsaken. And the populous city, that's the congregation, do you understand the congregation? The populous city shall be deserted. And the hill and the watchtower shall be for dens forever, a joy of wild asses and a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness become a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest. Awesome. The wilderness is where we're going to bear fruit, folks. That's where the church is going to bear fruit. They're going to bring forth the fruit of Jesus Christ. They're going to walk as Jesus walked. And those that won't will be persecutors. You understand? Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And what he did with his sword is he separated Judaism, those that followed him and those that didn't. The majority were persecutors. The rest were going to their cross. Well, this time it's not Judaism. This time it's Christianity. A great persecution is going to come our way from Christianity, from people who will not depart. Do you know what what separated the church in the early days? It was the full gospel. The full gospel. Think about it. Those people who did not want what Jesus had or what he offered and were criticizing the move of the Holy Spirit through him were people who would not accept the full gospel. And they persecuted him and his disciples for it. They didn't enter into the Spirit. They did not receive the Spirit. and They did not enter into the things of the Spirit or the power of the Spirit. And that's where we're headed. Exactly what happened in the book of Acts is going to happen again. Exactly. Except this time it's worldwide. But the power of the Spirit's going to be poured out and the wilderness 
God's people are going to bear fruit. Verse 16, Then justice shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness shall abide in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. And my people shall abide in a peaceable habitation, and in safe dwellings, and in quiet resting places. You know, it's going to be very important that we believe Psalm 91 in the tribulation period. See, Jesus made provision for everything. Everything. He made provision for, for the healing of our body, the healing of our soul, the healing of our circumstances, the protection. Jesus became cursed for us, Galatians 3 and 13. God took all of our curse and put it upon Jesus. And if we abide in Christ by faith, we will see that. He already took away all of our sins. Sin is not the problem. Faith is the problem. He has already taken away all of our sins and all of the curse that goes with it. We are delivered. We should not depart from the Word of God for any other gospel. But it shall hail in the downfall of the forest, and the city shall be utterly laid low. Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters that send forth the feet of the ox and the ass. The city shall utterly be laid low. You know it's going to be like it was in Russia um, at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. I did a lot of studying on that. I, I read up what happened. And um, there became two churches. There became an underground church and an above-ground church, and the above-ground church was just a stooge for the state and couldn't be trusted. Their doctrine couldn't be trusted, and they couldn't be trusted. And most of the ministers were in bed with the state, so they couldn't be trusted. That's where we're headed. And you know what? You know, People talk about um, all the... all the things that the government's doing and all the things that the, the false prophets are doing, but you know who's doing it all? The Lord's doing it all. The Bible says He works all things after the counsel of His own will. He's repeating history. He's raising up a beast to persecute the saints, to bring them to their cross. Maybe it's not always a physical cross, but you know that if we, if we do not die spiritually, in other words, die to self, we have to die physically because there's only one way to enter into life. There are going to be some people that are not going to die. These are special people that are not going to die. You know why? Because the last enemy to be overcome is death. You know what it means for these people not to ever die? It's because they've conquered all the enemies that led up to the last enemy. You understand? God is sovereign. He is almighty and He is sovereign. And there are people that are going to be alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. And they're going to be that way because they've walked with the Lord. The soul that sins must die. There's not one jot or one tittle going to pass away the law from the law until it's all fulfilled. The Bible says the soul that sins must die. If you don't die spiritually, meaning to self, you will have to die physically to enter into the kingdom. There's only one way to enter into the kingdom, through death. The only way you could get into the promised land is you had to go through Jordan. It represented death, you know. And it's not going to be a bad thing for, for saints to die because they'll enter into the presence of the Lord. But there is a prize that's greater than that because there are the, Jesus raised up two witnesses. Jesus, the man-child of his day, raised up two witnesses. And these two witnesses went forth into every place he was about to come. You follow me? They went out two by two in every place he was about to come. And they said, we are his witnesses. Are you following me? There is a fulfillment between Jesus' day and our day that's perfect. There is going to be two witnesses in our day that's going to cover the earth with the gospel. They're going to cover the earth with the gospel that they received from the man-child. And that's going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the man-child is going to be the first fruits of them that come into maturity of walking in Jesus Christ. 
And God's given them the job of sharing this unleavened bread. And they're going to send out two witnesses all over the earth. Miracles are going to be happening all over the earth. And a persecution against the saints all over the earth. And believe it or not, I believe that God's people are going to dwell in peaceable habitations, in quiet resting places. The peace of God is going to be upon God's people because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and because of revelation of the truth. The unleavened bread is going to be poured out. We think about those days, or many people think about the, those days, and many people don't want to accept the fact that the church is going through the tribulation period because of, they fear. They have fear of going into those days. This is nothing we're supposed to... Fear is the last thing you want to do. First of all, we should... We have, you understand some of the things I've been saying today? The expectations that we have is a revival of true Christianity, which we haven't seen in 2,000 years. There's been a great falling away. But most of the church is still in the dark ages. They've never climbed up out of that, out from under that rock. We have some awesome days coming. We have never seen anything like it. Great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, great move of God. And all of this is going to come about because God's people are motivated. They're motivated by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're motivated by the beast. They're motivated by the fact that they know they only have a short time left. You know, like the devil, he's going to be motivated too. He knows he has a short time left. The saints are going to be the same way. They know they have a short time left. This series by David Eels will be continued on our next broadcast. Thank you for tuning in. For more information and materials, go to www dot americaslastdays dot com